Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God I would lay on your hearts today comes to us from Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 9. We read, And after six days Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So far, God's holy word. Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, all of us have experienced moments in our lives that truly loom large. If I asked you to list the great moments your life, what would come to mind? What would qualify for that list? Perhaps the moment you walked across the stage and received that diploma on your day of graduation, or the moment you set foot on American soil after a long tour of duty overseas. Perhaps the moment you met your favorite sports star, or the moment you reeled in that trophy fish. Maybe the moment you said, I do, or the moment you got to Meet your newborn child. Moments like these stand out in our memory, don't they? About 700 years before Jesus was born, the Old Testament prophet Isaiah wrote this description about him. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. As far as appearance went, Jesus was not an extraordinary man. He was not a bodybuilder. He did not appear as some handsome or some royal prince. He did not have a halo over his head. He did not glow. You could not have picked him out of a crowd of people. Not most days, anyway. Today, we celebrate Transfiguration Sunday, the last Sunday in the season of Epiphany, a season in which we recognize how God has revealed his glory in the person of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. The ultimate example of this revealing happened on that Mount of Transfiguration, where an audience of three disciples experienced a standout moment, a moment that they would always remember. And so this morning we consider the theme, Jesus stands out as the radiance of God's glory and as the messenger of God's truth. You probably remember that Jesus' disciples had some confusion about just what exactly the Messiah was supposed to do. They had been waiting for him for a long time, but they weren't exactly sure what the Messiah all meant to them. Was he a bread king, only here to give food and comfort to people and make their lives easier? Was he a conqueror, here to lead a rebellion against the Romans and conquer them all and give God's people some justice? Well, the transfiguration is important to answer that question. It's important just before Ash Wednesday because of what is recorded in the last chunk of verses in Mark chapter 8, right before our text begins. There, Jesus asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And maybe you remember that Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And that was good. Peter made a pretty good confession, a bold confession about who Jesus was. But he didn't have it all completely straight yet. He knew who Jesus was, but he wasn't quite sure about what Jesus was going to do. Because in the very next verses, Jesus foretold that the Son of Man had come to suffer and die and rise again. And Peter had said, Lord, I'm not going to let that happen. I would die before I let you die. And remember, Jesus rebuked him and said, get behind me, Satan. You see, Peter 
did not think that Jesus had to die. He didn't want him to die. He didn't want him to suffer. But Jesus knew it was a vital part of his ministry. And so he rebuked Peter severely. Jesus goes on to talk about how it is the calling of every Christian to not be ashamed of the work of the Messiah, especially his suffering and death. But Jesus' disciples, they weren't totally ready for what was about to happen. They weren't ready for all that suffering. So they needed some helpful preparation. So Jesus rounds up his inner circle of disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he leads them up to this high mountain by themselves. All by themselves. When something uncertain or scary is about to happen, whether it be a midterm exam or a serious surgery or even the passion and suffering of Christ, it's a good idea to spend some time alone with Jesus. When we pray to God and meditate on the promises of his word, Jesus is always there, patiently preparing us with his presence. Just like he took Peter, James, and John up to the mountain to prepare them there for that uncertain and that scary time. We're not exactly what sure about what mountain they were on. We know they were still up in Galilee, the northern region of Israel. So maybe it was Mount Hermon or one of those nearby peaks. But regardless, it was probably a pretty decent hike up to the mountain. And at a certain point, they stopped. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Now when you hear that word, radiator, what do you think of? Probably that hot chunk of metal inside your car, right? Next to the engine block somewhere. Or maybe you think of one of the heat registers or radiators along the baseboards of our church or of a lot of buildings that are heated that way. In its simple definition, a radiator is something that radiates or emits light or heat. You see, when Jesus was transfigured before Peter, James, and John, he didn't just reflect or mirror God's glory. He radiated God's glory. It came from him because God's glory was of him. The Son of Man is also the Son of God. In a parallel account in Matthew, we read that his face shone like the sun. Jesus was transfigured, transformed, right there in front of his disciples. What was essentially happening was that the human nature of Christ and even his clothing was completely suffused by his divine nature. The fact that he was 100% God while also being 100% man. Talk about a standout moment. A memory that those disciples won't soon forget. Jesus was the radiance of God's glory, and he stood out as such. The question is why, right? It's kind of a mysterious event. What exactly was going on? Even now, we don't know as much about the transfiguration as we like. But that's kind of the story of our lives, isn't it? We ask a lot of questions. We want to know. Why was God doing this? What happened over here? What is meant by these things? And that's good. I think it helps when we consider that our gracious and merciful God is just that. He is full of grace and full of mercy. Remember that everything Jesus did here on this earth was for the benefit of his people. He didn't need to go be transfigured on that mountain all by himself. He did it for the benefit of his disciples and for the benefit of us. And when we remember those things, we can learn a lot from an event like this. Jesus' divine nature, the radiance of God's glory shining out of him, well, it reminds us that Jesus chose this freely. He chose to come to earth and live under the law. He chose freely to be crucified. He chose freely to die and pay for all our sins. It brings incredible meaning to those words we sing. Oh, love, how deep, how broad, how high, beyond all thought and fantasy. He bore that shameful sin and death for us. He gave his dying breath. And what about Peter, James, and John? Why show all this to them? Well, remember what was about to happen. Remember what they were about to go through. They were about to see their rabbi, their Lord and teacher, who they had been following for the past three months, they were about to see him betrayed, 
falsely arrested, illegally accused and tried, beaten, mocked, crucified, killed on that cross. They needed this encouragement. They needed it. They needed this standout moment to help them through the next few weeks. To remind them that, Jew, that Jesus truly was the radiance of God's glory, the Savior from sin. That he did, his story did not end at his death, but rather his resurrection and ascension. And as if Jesus glowing brighter than any spotlight wasn't enough, Moses and Elijah appear. And they were talking with Jesus. And we have more questions, don't we? Why these guys? What did they talk about? Well, how, how well do you remember your catechism examination questions? Who wrote the Old Testament? Moses and the prophets, right? Moses, the lawgiver, represents the law, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And Elijah, this other prophet, represents all the rest of it. So here we have represented all the promises, all the prophecies of the Old Testament, all of which point to Jesus, the Christ, all being fulfilled. Jesus told us in Matthew 5, 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And here he did. Both Moses and Elijah both spoke with God on Mount Sinai. Moses, when he received God's law in Exodus, and Elijah, when he fled from Jezebel. You remember that with a still, small voice? That was Elijah. Neither Moses nor Elijah had been able to stop sin itself. You remember that when Moses came down, as we read about, his face glowed, whereas Jesus radiates God's glory. Moses could only reflect it. And now, we're told in a parallel account in Luke that here they were talking to Jesus of his imminent decease in Jerusalem and of the redemption which they themselves had prophesied and which he was now fulfilling. Talk about a standout moment. A moment that radiated glory. The glory of God and the glory of Jesus which we read about in Hebrews 1.3. If that phrase, radiance of God's glory, rings a bell, it's probably from this. We read, He, Jesus, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of God's nature. And Jesus upholds the universe by the power of his word. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in the midst of this incredible moment, Peter says to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good that we're here. Let's make us three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say. They were terrified. Jesus here doesn't even give an answer to Peter. Peter speaks out of turn. And who among us isn't guilty of that kind of thing? When we say something that we really didn't mean to, maybe we have an idea pop into our head and before we know it, it comes out of our mouth. And as soon as it's gone, we wish that we could bring it back. That's what happens to Peter here in this verse. He has a bit of a habit of this, as you remember. But before we jump on him too much, let's think about what just happened. Have you ever heard that expression, a mountaintop experience? Well, now you know where it comes from, this text before us. Every Christian has spiritual mountaintop experiences some point in our lives. Maybe a super uplifting youth camp or conference where you just really feel connected with God's Word. Or maybe a women's conference where you go and you really just feel this fellowship between your fellow sisters in Christ and you feel very edified. Or maybe even a Christian funeral where all the heavenly readings and the powerful hymn singings just really hits you emotionally. These things happen. Spiritual mountaintop experiences, and they're really cool. They're an incredible blessing from, a God, from our God, and they really stand out in our memories, don't they? You can recall that feeling that one time. The trouble is that these spiritual mountaintop experiences don't last forever. Sometimes we are tempted to think that they are the only things that matter. 
that they're all encompassing and important. Kind of like Peter. Peter thought this is the height of spirituality. We should stay up on this mountain forever. Jesus, you stay right there. I'll build you a tent. I'll put up another one for Moses and one for Elijah. And we'll just be here for the rest of our lives. Because he didn't know what he was saying. He was scared. He was terrified. He thought that this was what it was all about. This vision of God's glory. Well, what was his mistake? He cared too much about those feelings, didn't he? The fact is, spiritual mountaintop experiences don't last forever, and neither do the feelings that accompany them. Feelings can change. Feelings can lie. We tend to focus on experiences and feelings at times, and we're focusing on earthly things, earthly glory. We tend to lose sight of what's really important, and sometimes we speak out of ignorance. Sometimes we say stupid things, like Peter said. Jesus didn't even answer him. He kind of disregarded it altogether. Instead, he let his father do the talking. In verse 7, a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. In last week's sermon, you might remember, we read from Deuteronomy chapter 18, where Moses prophesied about the coming Christ. In those verses, Jesus was called a prophet like Moses, a prophet with a capital P. And here in these verses, he's called God's beloved son. But the one thing that they both have in common is that command. Listen to him. Moses and Elijah were merely God's spokesmen, but Jesus is the bringer of all truth. Jesus stands out as that messenger of God's truth. We read about that also in Hebrews chapter 1, where the writer says, Long ago at many times and in many ways God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, like Moses and Elijah and all those other Old Testament figures. But in these last days he has spoken to us by his son, Jesus. Moments, even standout moments, they don't last forever. Neither do those feelings that accompany them. What happens after a spiritual mountaintop experience? What happens when you come rolling back down the hill? We go to the truth. We go to God's word. And the truth found in those words of Jesus. God's word which lasts forever. Which will never fade and never go away. What's the best spiritual experience that you could possibly imagine? It would probably be something like this, wouldn't it? Something like the Transfiguration? A personal experience with a radiant Jesus and two of the greatest Old Testament prophets of all time? Sounds pretty ideal. Hard to get much better than that, right? But the truth in God's Word is better. Do you know how we know that? Because God's Word tells us so. Peter himself actually tells us so. In the first chapter of his second letter, Peter tells his reader, when Jesus received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves, talking about him and James and John, we ourselves heard this voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have something more sure, Peter says, we have something more sure, the prophetic word which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter himself, who had that mountaintop experience, the experience of all experiences, says God's word is more sure. More sure than our memories. More sure than our standout experiences. More sure than our fickle human feelings. Jesus stands out as that messenger of God's truth. In the Word, the Word which is our solid foundation every single day of our lives. All the good moments, and all the great moments, all the sad moments, and all the sorrowful moments, Jesus is there, standing out in His Word for us. So maybe sometimes your guilt eats at you. Maybe you don't feel forgiven. But God's Word says, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses you from all sin. Maybe sometimes you don't feel close to God. Jesus in his word tells you, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. Maybe sometimes you feel like God has forgotten you or abandoned you. But God says, I will never forget my people. 
I have not left you as orphans. Even when you walk in the valley of death, I will be with you. God's word is more sure. Verses 8 and 9 go on. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. That miraculous experience was over, but they still had Jesus with them. And so do we. We, too, will always have God's word, which means we always have those words of Jesus with us at all times, no matter what. Always. Jesus tells them to wait to tell others until they had risen from the dead. After all, his main purpose was not his transfiguration, but it was our salvation. His death and resurrection is that truth that sets us free, that gospel message of Christ crucified for all our sins. That was his purpose. As Christians, now and then God blesses us with standout moments, wonderful moments that make wonderful memories. Sometimes these spiritual mountaintop experiences, like strong feelings of Christian fellowship or powerful emotions of closeness with God. But when those moments fade into memory, we still have Jesus. We always will. We still and always will have that cross and the empty tomb, the message of Christ for us. Because Jesus stands out as the radiance of God's glory, as the messenger of God's truth, and he always will. Thanks be to God. Amen.